First, I welcome to the first uh, reading session for the uh, Democracy Today, you know, uh, series. And we will have a number of such events in the following months. And first, a, a brief introduction. My name is Gilbert Chen. Right now, I'm an assistant professor of history department, and this is my colleague. Hi, folks. I'm Jabbar, assistant professor in the family studies and community development department. So first of all, how many of you have heard the democracy today, maybe? <laughs> okay, wonderful. So because it's an opportunity for me to introduce you to this very, very exciting meeting. So here is a website. And at this moment, it's not very much sex, but I bet you know, <laughs> in the following months, we are going to totally reinvent you know, the website. And so, Basically speaking, this committee is uh, is a child of our new team. Probably not so new at this moment. Is that right, <laughs> Chris? You know, uh, Chris Trulos. And the purpose of the committee is is to rethink what does democracy mean for America in the twenty first century. Because we see in recent years is a global backlash against democracy in different parts of the world. Is that right? Not only in Eastern Europe, same. Uh, Middle East, China, but also in America. So the committee is created to help us rethink how do we sustain democracy in 21st century? And no less importantly, what's the role and the responsibility of higher education? And because this is, what's the beauty? What does liberal arts do? to create a more sustainable democracy in America. And so, as you can tell, you know, it's a new committee and the first campus-wide event organized the, 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 by the committee would be the book, uh, would be the book talk in April, which is related to the case reading. So, There is a committee member, so it's a very, very interdisciplinary you know, committee consisting of faculty members from different you know, disciplinary backgrounds. And otherwise, so before our today's you know, discussion, let's do a kind of like personal you know, introduction. Both I and Dr. Jabra would introduce our story with democracy and the reason why we want to join it. So I come from China. And a country probably you wouldn't associate with democracy, all right? Probably everything anti democracy you would think of, like authoritarianism. Uh, what other terms would you describe Chinese politics? What comes to your mind? Communist, is that right? The, the ruling party. And uh, yeah, one party state. One party state, unlike America, there is only one party that dominated the politics mm -hmm. over the past seven decades. Yeah. Propaganda things. Propaganda, yes. The media had been totally controlled by the state. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, folks. Okay. So, then, you know, uh, I was raised up in a communist regime and I was. Fed with this kind of propaganda since a child onwards. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the propaganda in, in communist China uh, has a very, very strong national and uh, nationalistic tint. And it envisioned, like many countries with a strong nationalism, it envisioned an outside evil enemy. All right. You need an enemy to fight with. And that enemy on um, who is the number one enemy for comes to China nowadays? America, is that right? And then had one thing happened, or two things happened in 1999. I was a fifth grader at that point. In May of 1999, the first thing is uh, at that point, there was a civil war in Eastern Europe. And so basically speaking, America, together with a number of other UN nations, uh, tried to restore peace in today's Yugoslavia. And then in May, you know, the Chinese embassy in that country was bombed by US. 
airplanes. And an incident killed three Chinese journalists. And the state media back in China had launched a kind of anti American warfare. And that warfare had you know, trickled down into my classroom. My, 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 my grammar teacher, not my grammar, you know, Chinese language teacher, asked us to write a diary. You know, as a student, I really hate to write a diary or any kind of homework. All right, but nevertheless, that's homework you had to do. All right. So I write down, you know, I have never been to America. I don't know America, but nevertheless, under the influence of propaganda, I have to write, you know, a full page, you know, attack against American imperialism. And then, accidentally, two weeks later, there was a big movie released in China. And that movie happened to be the huge box feature in America as well, because that's an American movie. Can I guess what's the biggest movie in 1999? No, not 1997, that is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, precise about the knowledge. What happened? What's the biggest movie released in America in 1999? <laughs> that movie is part of one of the greatest movie franchises in history. Star Wars. Well, no. Not my favorite, but not. What's that movie? Some what? Well, Probably <laughs> you are too young for that. Yeah. Now rush hours. That's not big enough. What is the Phantom Menace? Exactly. <laughs> the Phantom Menace. You know the Star Wars. You know the new trilogy. And that movie got released in China. And and because I remember that movie so vividly because it was the first time the school organized the whole school to go to the movie theater and watch the movie. And, but unfortunately, after watching the movie, the school asked us to write a kind of review. And, but I really enjoyed the movie. And then these two events happened in one month. Anti-America propaganda, you know, diary, and then I was shocked by watching this marathon movie. And I, even though it, the movie had been criticized by movie critics, I really love it. The, the visual effects for the drama were mm -hmm. stunning. And so, you know, that led me to think, you know, what does America mean to me? And no less importantly, and later I become fascinated with American movies. American movies taught me a lot of things. For example, you know, America was the most invaded country in the world by aliens had been destroyed multiple <laughs> times, right? <laughs> so also to think about American democracy, for example, every time, you know, there was a rest the policeman would say the Miranda, you know, warning, is that right? Mm -hmm. And so that leads me to think about, like, you know, what does democracy mean, you know, because I don't see that a lot in my own country. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why when I first arrived in America in 2012, uh, I, I want to know more about how democracy functions. And then I see, you know, it's more complicated. Uh, because I'm, I'm a Chinese, I suddenly realized, you know, that America is not merely a white or black city or society. But nevertheless, you know, you wouldn't see a lot of Asian American places in mainstream, you know, movies. And so that's the reason why when I got a job, I decided to, you know, when I heard of the news of the establishment of democracy committee, I'm a, I was very eager to join. And I want to make a decision because in recent years, the China the Chinese politics just become more and more anti-democratic. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want that happen in this country. And that's the reason why I want to join. And that's the reason why I think this book is very mm -hmm. And I hope you know today's discussion will be really, really productive. Mm -hmm. It could be very, very, you know, for many it would be uneasy because of the topics because the author's discussion, but nevertheless, it's sort of provoking. So now I will leave the floor to my colleague. Um, so we thought it was really interesting that you know, the two of us as Democracy Today uh, members, committee members, 
both have a uh, background of immigrants. So I immigrated um, uh, as a young child. I was nine, came here with my family. My father moved us here from India. And the goal really was, I mean, we weren't pushed out from our, our country. We came because he thought this place had lots to offer um, and wanted to make that available to his children. Um, and so when we talk about, when we think about the state of affairs currently, it baffles us because um, we continue, and we continue to see it in immigrant populations that continue to come seeking refuge, um, uh, seeking opportunity, um, because you know the, the, the promise that it's here. Um, and it has been, it's been um, uh, for the most part good, uh, good for us, good to us. Um, and we want to continue to talk about how it can uh, uh, be available, the opportunity, the hope uh, for everybody. And so unlike Gilbert, I did not have any large, uh, moving, passionate reasons to, for, to be on the committee. I was told to be on the committee, so I joined the committee. <laughs> um, but it has since been a really interesting experience because I constantly think about parent-child relationships. I constantly think about um, child development, teen, adolescent development, young adult development. Um, and we are absolutely impacted by politics, right? When we think about families, when we think about parents and children, uh, we think about individual development. Um, and so it's been, um, it's been a really neat experience to be in discussion with other colleagues to talk about um, democratic ideals and values and what does it mean to be in liberal arts? What does it mean to be citizens? What does it mean to be instructors? Um, and you know, we hope to continue to have these conversations to create change in small ways um, within the college, within our departments, and with, um, with all of you and in conversation um, with us. This book um, is one framework for, for from, you know, from George Packer to help us understand his viewpoint of what is happening. You don't have to buy it completely, but it's a, it's a useful framework, right? That's what our theories do. Um, some of you know that. We talk about it all the time. What do theories help us do? Um, and so it's a framework for us to sort of view what's happening in our, in our times um, right now. Um, and um, he also ends with some, some, um, uh, some sort of propositions of how we could move forward. So we'll, we'll, we'll spend time uh, thinking about all of that uh, today. Well, we'll start <laughs> to, to talk about that today. Um, we have another meet, such meeting next month, and then it'll all culminate into a big discussion with the author um, in April. Um, and so we are hoping that, you know, um, uh, we're, we're happy to see so many of you and, and excited uh, to, to engage in this conversation. Um, so just, just to, before I ask questions, you all here. Um, we, so the, the, the book is what we're focused on, uh, what the final presentation is on. But for today's discussion, we're really, really focused on that um, Atlantic article, um, the, the Four Americas, um, because um, that's what we're sort of spending most of our time today. Um, and then I think, you know, hoping in the, in the next session or two, we'll, we'll sort of get to the other stuff. But we'll really just sort of focus on that and get our, get our get full sense of um, uh, clarity about what uh, George Packer is talking about when he's describing these Americas um, and what it means for us as um, citizens and as students and faculty and so on. So I just want to clarify the relationship between the article that we are going to discuss and the book, because basically speaking, the article is an essential part of the book, arguably the longest chapter of the book. So it's if you are yet engaged, I bet you that right. This is really a page turner in the article. So if you want to know the author's solution to the problems he had laid out in the article, just to read, you know, the, the rest of the book, and that would be the topic for for our March session. And I think it's also interesting because the article doesn't cover it. But how did we get here? 
I think that's really essential reading, and that's at the beginning of the the beginning of the book, right? So we want to because it's interesting, and you again, you buy it, you agree with it. What do you think, right? So both of those parts are um, uh, absolutely interesting and um, uh, interesting reads. So why are you here? The quick sort of take from especially our students. What brings you here? Other than the requirement. <laughs> well, my peers and I are here in the class, but I think it's also like a very interesting topic. It's been class we've been talking about it for a while now. Um, not specifically about everything, but uh, it really just brings up a lot of like things that are very much prevalent like today. And I think that's important to know. And, and I think in class we talk about context and like what that means in context. And we went to a panel, uh, you know, talking to the professor over there. What class she teaches, but uh, also like what like malinformation, disinformation, all these things that play a huge role into what we're learning independently and also here. Uh, so yeah, so that's a lot of here. Excellent. And you cover most of it. <laughs> Any other reasons? For I find political tribalization kind of interesting. It's like a phenomenon, and how like these tribes are described as. More like nuance compared to like standard political lines and parties. Yeah. It's like a country with like a two party system. You bet. I bet you are a pretty precise major. Yeah. So I'm here because my friend told me about this. <laughs> it just sounded kind of interesting. I really like learned about democracy and how it's kind of shown up throughout history and stuff and different like manifestations of it. It's just wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I'm here for the extra credit for my head Gilbert's out there because it's interesting to see democracy, socialism, and communism, how it runs in different parts of the world. Like Chile used to be a communist country from 1973 to 1990, in the beginning of the 90s when Pinochet was in power. Any other hands that I missed? All right. Okay, so I'm glad that you know some of you choose to join other than you know the extra credits, you know, <laughs> reasons. It's not very really encouraging. There's nothing wrong but, with extra credits. Yes, yeah, but <laughs> more importantly, I hope this discussion will make you realize it's, it's more than worth it that one or two extra credit points. Is that all right? Okay, so so yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna start with just quick. Summary. So the way that we're going to move forward really is we're going to do the uh, uh, Dr. Shannon and I are going to do this little bit together, and then we're going to break you up into smaller groups. And we really like faculty that are here to sort of move around and find a group of students to be a part of instead of clustering together. Um, and um, and then we're going to have uh, in small groups have discussions and then come back in a larger group. But before I sort of break you off, you know, a couple of things I you wanted to attend to um, uh, before we sort of send you off, and then we'll come back together and, and, and do a discussion. So some of the divisions um, that Hacker talks about, I think, are are important, and we want to highlight them um, because it sort of sets the stage for you know for, for where we are, and it's always important to sort of see what was the setting of the stage. Um, and so this, these ideas that um, since, the, since the late 60s, early 70s, things have just so, America has always been divided, but the divisions were not so um, clear and they weren't, they weren't so many, right? So there were two parties, um, but when we start to see this, uh, this, this emergence of these four groupings that are taking place, so what's happening, we're seeing um, economic changes to decline in manufacturing jobs, um, and where there, when there was a time when you could get a high school degree and still maintain a middle class life, where you had a car, you had a house, you had a holiday, um, more and more that was not possible without getting a college degree. And so we start to see some of that shift taking place of what who is seen to be privileged and who is not. Um, a growing uh, divide between the very rich and the very poor, right? So we're seeing um, a, a, a big divide. He talks about 
Um, 70s saw a, real, a, a significant change in our immigration policies, and we're, so we're seeing an influx of greater diversity in immigrants. Um, we, um, and then, of course, this, uh, this idea of um, the role of mass media, I find fascinating, um, in this polarization of um, that that exists, but then they're highlighted, and then they're um, um, they're your your pitching hole. Once they know where you sort of lean, they'll keep bombarding you with they meaning you know mass media in the form of social media and other um, and other online media um, bombarding you with things that um, uh, keep sort of keep you in your pitching hole. And of course, with um, uh, uh, a decline in local newspapers and an increase in sort of national sort of, um, uh, newspapers, again, you don't know what's happening globally. You're really focused on what's happening at um, the national level. So a couple of things that sort of he highlights, which I find fascinating, and then he sort of leads us into talking about the four Americas. Um, we have a little clip. Uh, about uh, him talking about um, these four Americas for any of you who might not have, who might not remember um, the, the four America. Uh, it's like a warm up exercise. Mm -hmm. Refresh your memory. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. Here you see the influence of media, all right? And of numerous books, his latest Last Best Hope, an essay on the revival of America, he, uh, theatlantic.com, you can find his writing, uh, or on Twitter, at uh, you can tweet him at, at The Atlantic. George Packer. Uh, George, this is a brilliant book, Last Best Hope, America in Crisis and Renewal. Um, I, your idea in the Equal America chapter of the smart and just versus the free and real, I want to get into, but I'd, I'd like to start first with your notion of the four Americas. Tell us, tell us about the four Americas that you're writing about here. Thanks for having me on, Tom. Um, well, after writing about the year 2020, this year of shocks and of defeat, I stepped back to find out how did we become so divided and it's not just between red and blue, although that's an ob the obvious division, but red and blue themselves are divided. On one side, we have what I call free America. That's Reagan's America. That's you get the government out of the way. Uh, government isn't the solution, it's the problem. Cut my taxes, get rid of regulations, and set me free so that I can uh, make my own fate in life. This is and the Charles it, Koch the America, really. <laughs> It's a libertarian America, right. exactly. And and it promised widespread prosperity through trickle down. It, ne it never happened, it failed. So free America was a powerful political uh, narrative that promised a lot and influenced us Im immensely, but that never delivered on its promises to a wide uh, number of Americans. It, it, it delivered for a very narrow slice of the country Smart America is educated, professional America, the meritocrats, those who believe that the right schools, the right credentials, the right professions are the key to a good life and a successful life. And that parents can then pass on the, the, the advantages of being meritocrats to their children who will then be, earn their own way into that blessed group. The problem with smart America, and I think of that as sort of Bill Clinton's America and really having its heyday in the 90s. Smart America promised a meritocracy, but it really created an aristocracy. You're born a meritocrat. Your ticket is punched depending on who your parents are, where you grew up, what schools you go to, and who you know. And so it really isn't any longer merit that gets you to the promised land, it's birth. And that is the definition of aristocracy. So it has also failed. This, the third and fourth narratives are rebellions against the failures of the first two. On the red side is real America, a phrase Sarah Palin used in, two, in the 2008 campaign. That's the America of the white Christian heartland. It's nationalist, it's nativist, and it sees white Christians who work 
with their hands or who don't have college degrees as the true Americans and the, the educated elites, the coastal liberals, people live in cities, people who come from other countries, and in many cases, people who are not white are not real Americans. And so it has an exclusive um, cast to it and a, a resentful cast. The smart Americans are bitterly resented, I think, by real America. And finally, just America, which is a generational rebellion of young, mainly millennials, against the promises of their liberal parents who said, work hard and go to the right schools and do your homework and write that beautiful college application essay and your future is set. When, in fact, that began to seem like a hollow life and a false idea and so the social justice movement of the last six seven years i date it to 2014 as the beginning of just america um is a rebellion against a the the promise of incremental improvement of the more perfect union instead it says we're a caste system we have groups that oppress other groups always have probably always will and the, the most we can do is continually fight against that in the name of justice so that's also a rebellious narrative that has tried to break up the complacency of of the earlier ones those are the four americas that i lay out in last best hope and 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 so what we are going to do right now as, as dr Mubar has just mentioned we are going to reshuffle the classroom is that right move your from your comfortable zoom and merge with others and so ideally speaking, one each group would have like uh, one or several faculty members, uh, one or several staff members, and most students, as you can see from the room. Is that right? And I have to use my authority and to divide the room probably into four parts, four sessions, four Americas. Is that right? And well, we I I, I think four to five people in a group. Oh, four to five people yeah, in a group. But if it gets too big, then it. So we are going to have more. Four to five people. Find four to five people to sit with. But I'd like the faculty to sort of find a, a, a group of four to five students to sort of sit with. Uh, we need a few more students to join this group. Okay. So, what you need to do first is to introduce your names to your group members, okay? And probably your the major of, of departmental activities, okay? And we have a number of questions for you. Things, but I want one person to speak on your group's behalf when we come back to the larger group. Yes. And the faculty know it's not them. Yeah. So <laughs> it'll be one of your one of the students. Um, and so I just I just want to so before we get into the questions, before we get into the questions, I just want to remind everybody, you know, we're talking about we might be. Maybe we're all the same. We're all in the same bubble. And so maybe there's um, there's not a lot of friction. But um, what I'd really like us to remember is how do we talk about really powerful, passionate topics in respectful manner, right? So being really empathic uh, when you're listening, remaining focused um, on what is being said, avoiding personal attacks. And really, again, this is Hacker's um, theoretical framework. It's not him personally we're talking about. And so he's proposed a framework to, through which to, to see what he's seen, okay? Um, and then think about reason and um, uh, uh, logic. Um, instead of only focusing on emotions, emotions are important essential and what gets us to go. Um, but let's um, also think about logic and reasoning. 
The other thing to please think about, maybe you find yourself in a group where everybody thinks the same. Just because the other is not present does not mean that we get to say whatever we want to say about the other, okay? In fact, we have to be more careful about the other when they are not present and they cannot give voice to their perspective. Um, so let's be respectful um, of whatever the other is, whoever the other is, as, um, as we're engaged in these discussions. What we're gonna spend most of the time on are these discussion questions. And so these are our guidelines. Um, see how it goes for your group. Maybe you spend more time on one than the other. Um, but this is what we're hoping for you all to talk about. You know, what are really, so we got a little taste of the four Americas. Um, what are these defining characteristics? Really define them for each other. Clarify any mis misunderstandings. Question, attend to any questions that come up. Um, uh, uh, what, um, and then think about uh, how does your lived experience align with some of what George Packer is talking about, about these four Americas. Um, think about the role of college, the role of higher education, um, what role it might have played. Remember Smart America? We're part of, we're in, we're part of, that's Smart America. Um, and so, what role has higher ed played or plays in the formation and the continuation of these four Americas? Um, what do you make, uh, what, what role mass media play in this? Um, you know, how do you think the four Americas could learn to understand and empathize? So moving forward, if you get that far. Um, um, and then again, what role could higher ed be playing to guide the, you know, that hope part he talks about, last best hope, he does leave us with some hope. So what is that? What is that? How do we reach it? And how, how does higher ed um, help us to reach um, that goalpost? Um, and that's it. Um, and so probably the most important is, you know, I hope every group already discussed, you know, George Parker will come to campus in April and you got a chance to ask him questions, you know, right? So each group, please, produce a question you want, you know, the author to answer, okay? <laughs> and we were solicited and we were deep, you know, the questions to the author and we are going to, you know, grill him, you know, I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, same question. Absolutely. So, and we'll, we'll, we will save those and um, use them in the future. So, any questions for us before you all begin? And we're just, uh, we're gonna like sort of float around and just listen in on the thing. Um, um, and hang out wherever, you know, when you feel like you know, uh, 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 are here. Yeah. All right. And then we'll come back okay. together. Great. So, I think um, we'll, we'll spend a good half, half hour on this. Okay. Half hour. Half hour. All right. So let's come back. Um, so now they're just setting up the food outside. So you'll be able to replenish energy. Um, so let's come back together. We're going to spend a few minutes to sort of hearing from you all about what you've discussed um, before we sort of move on to the whole. Yeah. So probably let's begin with like a establishing the baseline. You know, the author has to talk like four Americas. All right. Probably each group like just to mention one America <laughs> and giving you can create a lot uh, a list of like you know tags to describe what the America looks like according to the author. Okay, which group wants to be the first? Come on. You know. <laughs> so the defining characteristics of the four Americas, what'd y'all talk about that first question? Yeah. We, we actually went out of order. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. Order of yeah, we oh. chose what they wanted to do first. <laughs> oh, all right. So <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> so nobody wants to nobody wants to attend to that first question. We move on. I volunteer as tribute. <laughs> okay, well, let's see. Free America would be, I would say, the more traditional form of Republicans that focus on a strong emphasis of defending for the free market from like government over from government overreach, as well as a degree of like being more moderate on social questions, but always kind of like somewhat relying on like on the proto-free America eventually for like on social questions as a kind of unifying coalition. 
all smart and just America are reflective of the Democratic Party, with the smart America reflecting a sort of pseudo technocratic elite class of mainly, I would say, white and Asian Americans overall, and just America being a sort of proto example of like defending like America's like minority rights that kind of began to emerge more seriously recently. That sort of like existed underground with like minor with like mainly African American and like Hispanic Americans, but began to really emerge as their numbers numbers began to increase throughout the throughout like the late 20th and early 21st centuries. And then there's a real and that is real America. Yeah, real America is like sort of like a nativeish backlash from like the American heartland, and especially like in white working class areas that may have historically didn't belong to like either party, but mostly swung to the Republicans heavily like the 2016 election under the promises of Trump's return to like nativism and like protectionism. Oh, so wonderful, you know, and my heart is on me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very precise and exemplary. I really, really appreciate it. But, you know, uh, probably just a slow down a little bit, that would be okay. You, you are just like, I'm watching a YouTube video at like 1.5. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now we have established the baseline and we can move on to the second question is, how does this book perhaps our uh, four narratives are related to your personal experiences? So probably we will move to this side of the It's like the common expression. Look around and no one wants you. Like, no, I take that initiative. Okay. Okay. About like how we talk about things in poor Americas. I said I didn't really like smart America. It's kind of like I feel like it kind of does it kind of like puts people at disadvantage because if, if someone tries to go into like a smart America, they try to like build themselves up, they kind of end up kind of this debt where they can't they can't really go further than what they are. They have the education, they have the background, but they're like they're disadvantaged just kind of from like a monetary perspective. And for me personally, like in my life experience, my uncle, he didn't have, he didn't have a college, he not a college, he just didn't have a high school degree. He dropped out of high school, all stuff. he makes just like probably more money than my dad. And he has a full college degree, like this computer science, everything. Like he, my uncle works for, I think like the monorail system and like the, like all that stuff. So. I grew up, yeah. No, when I said I like America because like America was really free. It, it was really built to to help like one sort of like group so I, so like so as a black woman you just like what do you mean free like <laughs> what do you mean so mm -hmm. i had i had i had a little problem with that mm -hmm. they're first and like and like today like they're just, we're still not free to have so much stuff going on yeah. in different groups so yes yeah, so. exactly so here you know the author's understanding of freedom is Many two things in that, right? The first is basically speaking, government don't mind my business mm -hmm. and give me tax cut. I don't want to pay tax to the government. Mm -hmm. No one wants to do that. Mm -hmm. And the second is about like the freedom as kind of identity, that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's my yard, get out. Otherwise, I'm going to show you my God, mm -hmm. that, right? <laughs> and so it's, it's definitely, you know, the true freedom is. So now let's move to this side of. Well, I'm wondering. I, I mean, I, it, you don't have to just sort of go down the list of questions. What, uh, what, what did, what sort of, what did you talk most about? Yeah. Um, well, the last thing that we discussed was the question about what role could college play in bridging the divide. That's okay. Um. So what I was just saying was that, like, first things first, college needs to be accessible. Mm -hmm. Um. With the lack mm -hmm. of accessibility to college, it's like people aren't getting the opportunity to go sit in a classroom and to hear conversations like this and to form like opinions for themselves based off of like facts. So, and then especially when it comes to like, you know, social media and just like people in your community, however you might find information, if it's not like coming from actual like professionals who have like research or like actual evidence that is like, you know, peer reviewed and like based in actual like, you know, something with substance. It is like you don't do all these opinions that you form could be like, you know, kind of mute moot. So it's just like at the end of the day, if college isn't accessible, if it's not, if it's this expensive just to go to a, a undergrad college, I mean, imagine like people who want to 
continue the conversation and go to grad school or like, you know, get like a doctorate, PhD or a master's, whatever they want to do. Like they can't even do things like that because they don't have the money to. And then it doesn't help that the people who do have the money kind of keep it circulating or circulating within that one group and not really like helping other people like go out and get those opportunities as well. So it's just like you're kind of keeping the opportunity to learn more based in like this small group of people. So it just kind of doesn't really allow much space for everyone to create their own opinion so that we can actually look at, okay, this is what's going on. This is how people are being treated. This is how people are, you know, not benefiting from this, but these people are benefiting from this. How can we make sure everyone receives these benefits? We don't know because nobody is really learning or not enough people are learning about what they need to be learning about to be able to talk about um, a solution, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I was going to say to add on, um, a lot of people aren't able to afford to go to college, and then they're forced to get a job that they can't make a livable wage on, mm -hmm. and that keeps circling around as well. So the, exactly part, she, so the part of the question is, how to make the college more affordable? No taxes that nobody wants to pay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, probably I'll give you one example. I'm a first generation college you know, student, mm -hmm. and I was born in China. And luckily, the speed in going to college in the tuition fee in China was so low. Can you guess how much I pay for one academic year at top like, 20 universities in China for one academic year, the tuition fee, including the boarding fees? I live on campus. Can you guess? I live in Beijing, you know, the, one of the most expensive cities in China, or in the world nowadays. Can you guess how much I pay for tuition? $2,500? Well, $500? Yeah, $500 for one semester, and a 1000 for one academic year. And I rent a room on campus, and I pay $100 a month. <laughs> Could that also be because like uh, China prioritizes education of their people primarily like the skill base? So uh, rather than like I feel like here in the US it's more like an option. So, so like, that's a good question. China's market is not unique. You go to Europe, you would find numerous very, very state of art universities. Their tuition is relatively speaking very, very low because they were public. They were subsidized by the government. <laughs> so that's the purpose of public education, that right? Make that affordable. But unlike here, the public universities, their tuition fee is low, but not so low, is that right? <laughs> yeah, so so here in the public, is that right? The public so what Dr. Chan is talking about, maybe what we should be thinking about is instead of K through 12 public education that is free and that by the state, we're talking about K through 16, yeah? Or K through 14, right? Potentially, I don't know. So the, the, the conversation, but at least we have a conversation and that's the goal of, of doing this is to continue to have conversations about how do we then um, attend to the needs of those that, that want the college degree but can't get it, um, how do we attend to that? What else did you all, what did you spend the most time talking about in your groups? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Even if you get a college degree, I also learned that just because you get a college degree doesn't mean you get a good career. Like if I want to work at a museum after I graduate in May, it doesn't guarantee I will work on a museum because, again, not every place will accept people with autism, too. Like, you have to be a certain way. And that's the way it's technically true. Yeah. 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 So that's the whole Right, thing. absolutely. So, does your getting a job after the degree, are there enough jobs available? for all um, that want that job. Are your jobs 
paid well enough. I come from family studies. <laughs> Most undergrads go off to do <laughs> go off to do nonprofit work, go off to do, you know, they go off to do phenomenal work, but guess how much they're getting paid? So how do how how are we, you know, how how so the idea of getting the degree but then getting a job that also has that accessibility to opportunities and then getting paid um, a, a living wage. I mean, getting, getting uh, compensated for the work that you've done, absolutely. What else were you talking about? Oh, sorry, up there. So we talk a lot about like social media and like straw bags oh. with like performance, performance like videos and stuff mm -hmm. and how like specifically during like George Floyd, like the incident with him and how he was like, all the stuff and like how people were coming out like trying they're showing oh we're supporting black lives matter and they would like paint their face and like mm -hmm. they have like the slow song oh, slow song in the mm -hmm. background yeah like the tiktok videos mm -hmm. and then like um they like, they did it and they clipped the video they would do it to you like the malcolm Moore song same love and like that's a song about like same sex relationships and like all that stuff that's doesn't equate to racism so right. they're, like the the um how do you well I said that when when the whole George Floyd thing happened and the whole TikTok thing was just popped up or whatever, some creators they they would they would they would post things and they would get into faces they would use songs that didn't really make sense with the whole situation like they like, like they use nothing more say love as like to equate to racism. I was like, are you dumb? Like this you can you can support BLM all you want, but the whole permanent BS I like has to stop because like it's offensive like like the um the uh the rioting protesting like people lost their lives like people like so it's like and, and half of them will never experience what a black person goes through so if they're like oh I support it support what exactly like what are you doing so so you support your cause like like let's to, to talk about the community. right so I mean like the whole TikTok social media thing they make money off that so once the thing is like you're being it's it's good because like you will never know what it's like as a black woman or, or, or even a black man to go through like being the bigger by a police officer getting like all around like so I would think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Is that a student response to Gary, is that right? Yeah. I think this is going along with that. After 2020, 2021, Black mm -hmm. Lives didn't matter anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it just ceased to exist. You don't hear anything about it anymore. There's no protest anymore. There's no education, further education anymore. And it's many like social media outlets, especially TikTok. During the period of 2020, all I saw was mm -hmm. this right after right and the education on Black lives and Black history. But I, now I don't see near one black person on my floor these days. Right. Sure enough. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, the um I'm gonna probably say something very unpopular, but I feel like that also not not to like not acknowledge what you guys are saying, which is very true, but I think it's also the idea that like there's been some negativity on TikTok, on Instagram surrounding Black Lives Matter, right? Like mm -hmm. what happened with the organization. Yeah, sure. They're talking about it. Yeah. But like nobody speaks about yeah, it, right? Sure. I didn't hear one person she on social media be like they wasted all of it. Like there was legitimate people, white, black, Hispanic, whatever, that donated to that, right? Mm -hmm. And so nobody acknowledged that. So I yeah. think it's also like you have to acknowledge that there's wrong things, there's malinformation, there's disinformation, but you have to be able to like even as college students, you have to be able to be like, I don't think this is right. Let me go check if it's right. Right? Like, when was the last time I think anybody here was like, well, this person said this. Let me go and like see if it's right or accurate. Nobody does that. I think most people are guilty of probably reading something and being like, did you hear that? Who did that? And then that person's just gonna spread it even more, mm -hmm. but nobody actually does the due diligence mm -hmm. and say like, I'm gonna go check into this and see how true it is. Mm -hmm. Especially okay, so we have any several students. Yeah, I'm sorry. Please, I'll rock up. I'll just yeah. So we have several well, students. Before, I just want to, because I think um, the idea that, because I think there is continues to be a lot of discussion about critical race theory. Um, and we know that that discussion is ongoing. Um, I think Florida was discussing AP credit for African American history force. So maybe Black Lives Matter as a logo isn't being sort of promoted, but I would say that if you if you listen real close, the conversations have not died 
Maybe they continue to go where they've always been, which is in academics, right? The academics continue to talk about it. How do we create dialogue between non-academics? And so that critical race theory discussion, that AP American history course in Florida, that discussion is ongoing. And, and I think that, I mean, that is very much connected to Black Lives Matter, right? And so don't feel like it's, it's all forgotten. There are people who are keeping the conversation alive. And so let's give them, give them recognition. Let's find ways to recognize them in our TikTok feeds and so on. Um, well, I was gonna say kind of like we talked about how social media plays a part, a big part in it because we give everyone a platform to say what like not, nothing, no one can stop me from going on my phone and people believe in what I said. But to build off that, I think a lot of the frustration is with. The fact that it's not like obviously if people are doing the work they're doing all the important things in regards to the black lives matter movement but the fact that it's not like the youth is influenced by social media mm -hmm. like there's no denying that so the fact that it's not like mm -hmm. presented or i think that's the right time. like it's not it's not right in front of us the mm -hmm. way it needs to be and that's the frustration and the lack of representation and like continuing to work. There are several issues of a one is how this social media has become performative. Mm -hmm. It's just for performance. Mm -hmm. It's for money making. Mm -hmm. A second related issue is how algorithm mm -hmm. make sure some videos would be more popular than others. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Would it be on the top list? Yeah. So probably that another. So one last, I think one last, yeah, because yeah. I want to move on. I'm just conscious of the time. So, who you I would also say like TikTok is like a like I don't use TikTok, but I would say like TikTok is a very is is a I would say a platform that doesn't really bode well for like trying to cross read everything or trying to cross check, and the company does, itself does not seem to be very responsible for like how its users behave, behave overall. And I would say that while I would say like TikTok, I would say is a very fun app, it also promotes some very dumb ideas, and that its user base overall seems very young in general, and that probably doesn't help it overall. It's just uh, anyone want to comment on the social media? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I want to finish my last thought. Oh, <laughs> I wanted sorry. to say that, like, I, I think Black Lives Matter, um, as a movement, was mm -hmm. it's amazing. I just think the way it was put out there was not the best, right? Like, how it was put in social media, and then with social media, I think that everybody in this room who has a phone and has an Instagram mm -hmm. or a Snapchat or any kind of like social media uh, that spreads information has the duty and a responsibility to play a part and not participate in it. So I think everybody does. And I think a share, a like equals you spreading that message, right? So I think everybody here is guilty of it. And I think if we want to see less of it, read whatever you have to read on social media, check it, right? Like mm -hmm. you're on your phone, well, we're all on our phones all the time, right? Like it doesn't take that, if you can read that message, we can also look up that message and see how true and accurate it is. And I think we all have that duty. So my, one of my friends has told a strategy to bet against, the battle against the algorithm, is every time you search a topic, you search the opposite. I do that. <laughs> yeah. I do that. Yeah, so otherwise, you wouldn't get up so biased, yeah. you know, the, 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 the recommended list of video clips, all right, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Or I prefer like more trusted sources, like from establishment types. Like two of the main sources of news I get on like YouTube are The Economist and like The Wall Street Journal. Yeah, I wouldn't say that I use social media as my end all be all source. I feel like I should not be opposite to put everyone on there. And I also don't equate Black Lives Matter to the organization itself. I equate the actual Black Lives and that they matter. I, I, I feel like even with how social media is, the algorithm has become an algorithm. The algorithm literally blocks people for the color of their skin and for their sexuality and for the topics that they discuss. Mm -hmm. yeah. So even if you do look mm -hmm. at the media or the social media that we mm -hmm. are consuming, it does not even equate to everything that's mm -hmm. on there. We're not, it blocks a certain, like, mm -hmm. you yeah, only want to get a certain amount of social media. You're not getting the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Just because of the algorithm, it's not even just yeah. how we consume. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so we have yeah, the last one. No. Okay. 
Okay, so just just mindful of the time. Um, we wanted to sort of finish off on talking about so what right? the whole part, the forward part, and I wanted to bring up this um, organization um, that does the work. The so what. Um, this is an organization called Braver Angels. It started off in 2016 as something called Better Angels. In 2020, they changed their name to um, Braver Angels. Um, it was co-founded by uh, a Dr. Bill Doherty. He's up at University of Minnesota. He is a marriage and family therapist by training for all my family studies people. Um, and um, he was brought on board because he has spent his academic career looking at divorce and divorcing couples. And so they wanted to find out from him, could he create a program where you have opposing sides talking to each other and listening to each other. And so this is a little clip on um, that program, which has just grown uh, tremendously um, uh, from you know, where they started in 2016 to, to where they are now. So just take a listen. Okay, so we have run out of time. You know, I love, as I have mentioned at the beginning of today's uh, session, I really love movies. And there are a lot of movies, you know, uh, with a title with like the last, you know, the last stand, the, the end again. But what's, what's interesting about movies, they also always got like a sequels, you know, right? A comeback stories. And I think that's, that's the message that we can learn from today's session and the, the following month's session as well is that there is always hope. And as long as you don't give it up, and as long as you don't give it up, you know, trying. And so, you know, this is just one model. Someone is doing these things. And I think we, what we need to do is just you know, think a way, you know, to, to, to have a conversation with others. I think everything, everything good is start with a conversation, a dialogue. And yeah. So last thing, because I've talked about you know, things in the class, and you can only have dialogue with people who are willing to have dialogue with you. And so we are we are cognizant of that. We're not saying let's just sing kumbaya and call it a day. Um, but it sounds like there are people who are willing to have conversations. It's our job to find them. Um, and to engage in those conversations. Um, and so we hope that part of what we're doing is having those conversations, at least here in our small way, in our small university, in our small college and department, and um, continue to grow. Thank you so much for making time. Thank you. Uh, I'm the doctor. Oh, we have that.